Excellent. Thank you. I am sharing my screen. So the title of the talk, as Mark, as Mark said, is, is a little bit of a clickbait, actually, you know, four reasons why social media make us vulnerable to manipulation. So it's in the theme of misinformation, which or, or, or misleading information, which is uh, what we study here at the Observatory on Social Media. But I will actually uh, keep to it. I will actually go over four different uh, types of vulnerabilities that are created by social media platforms or by our own uh, social or cognitive bias as we interact with others on social media platforms. So let's start with number four, and that is echo chambers. So we all have heard a lot about echo chambers, and uh, but I think maybe a good way to illustrate what I mean by echo chambers is to show you a little model. Uh, so this is a very simplified model of a social media network. The nodes here are people and the connections are, you know, like when you follow somebody on, 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 on Twitter or friend them on Facebook or Instagram, etc. cetera, uh, people have feeds and you can post something to your feed or you can uh, look at what your friends have posted and you go down the feed and you can choose something to reshare it with your friends. So basically, these are very, very basic mechanisms of pretty much any social media platform. And there are two key ingredients in this model. One is social influence. That is when people post, they post things that re tend to reflect uh, their own opinions. And when you are exposed to some opinion that is not too different from yours, you may change your opinion a little bit according to some parameter going in the direction of what, uh, what you have been exposed to. So here the opinions are represented by the colors of the nodes. As you can see, initially they are uh, spread across one dimensional spectrum. So this is of course an extremely simplified toy version of the model of the world uh, where you have you know, like one dimensional people from progressive to conservative, but initially these are uh, uniformly distributed. And then uh, the second, bit, uh, the second ingredient is unfriending. So initially the connections are random, but when you see a friend post something that you strongly disagree with that offends you, um, you with some probability, which again is a parameter, you can choose to unfriend them, okay? And in this particular model, when you do that, you replace that link with a completely random link, which is shown here with the dashed line. So you, you, you replace, you, the dashed line is the link that you cut, and then the new random one that you create is the solid line. So let's let's let the model play out. And uh, you know you can see here that uh, you know there are actually messages being exchanged. Each message has has a uh, you know reflex of an opinion. As I mentioned, uh, you can see that the colors are beginning to change a little bit. You can see that some links are cut and rewired. Uh, and as the simulation runs on you will notice that the colors are changing in the sense that there is not so much diversity anymore. Uh, the, 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 the users here are sort of sorting themselves out into two groups, one mostly red, one mostly blue, and there is less diversity within each group. Not only that, but at the same time, uh, the rewiring also is taking place. And so the two groups are also sorting themselves out in terms of the connectivity so that the red nodes are more likely to be connected with other red nodes, the blue nodes are more likely to be connected with blue nodes. So this is a typical scenario that we call echo chamber on social media, where we actually see empirically that people mostly are connected and exposed to information from others that are similar to them. That's why it's called echo chamber, of course. And if you let the simulation run, inevitably you end up with the scenario where we have these communities that are very, very homogeneous, right? All the diversity is gone. The only opinions that you see are exactly identical to yours. And furthermore, there is complete segregation. So nobody has any exposure whatsoever to different opinion from, from, from the other side. Now, you can run the simulation multiple times and with some set of parameters, you always get the same outcome. If you guys wanna play with the simulation, it's available. Uh, this is the URL down there, and um, uh, you can you can set some parameters as you see at the top left. Like tolerance means like how close would an opinion have to be to mine such that it might influence me, or such that 
I might unfriend somebody with an opinion that is different. And depending on that, of course, we know from these kinds of models that you may end up with uh, one or two or more uh, di distinct communities. And then influence just regulates how quickly you may uh, evolve your or adapt your, your opinion to those of your friends. And then unfriending is like the likelihood that you unfollow somebody. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that as long as influence and unfriending are non-zero, you always end up with complete homogeneity and complete segregation. And in fact, you could also end up with this kind of echo chamber structure only with social influence, where of course the structure remains unchanged, but the opinions change, or only with rewiring, where the opinions stay the same, but the structure, you know, people sort themselves out. However, when you have both ingredients, again, no matter how small those probabilities, uh, this transition is very, very fast. It's orders of magnitude faster. And inevitably you end up with these completely segregated, completely homogeneous uh, groups. So because these ingredients of social influence and, and unfollowing are basically very are, are ingredients that are part of our own uh, you know, normal behavior, social uh, cognition, as well as platforms that we use, we can understand why very naturally we end up in these echo chambers in, in social media. Uh, now, let me take a slight digression. This is something that happened a long time ago. <laughs> Max has seen it before, he's smiling. Uh, back in 2014, we were the target, our research group was the target of a misinformation campaign. And I won't go into the details. It was just like completely fabricated stories that we were a secret government of organization spying on citizens and so on. It was amplified by Russian sources and uh, you know, it went viral and it was a disaster, a waste of six months of my life. But why am I telling you about this? Because um, you can look at the kind of narratives that were spreading on Twitter, the attacks, uh, all the false claims that were going around. And, and we were in fact studying the spread of misinformation online so we could trace uh, the diffusion of these uh, of these false narratives, which are shown here in the purple links, whereas the little yellow links that you see at the bottom, those are people who are actually sharing credible fact-checking information from uh, reputable sources like Science Magazine, for example, that were saying, you know, these claims are completely false, even though they are escalating to congressional discussions and so on, they're based on, on false claims. So where is this kind of discussion going on in the context of the discussion about the elections that was happening at that time. This was during the midterm elections of 2014. Well, this picture here is the classic picture that you get whenever you visualize a retweet network uh, of people talking about politics in the US. You see these big, two big echo chambers, the conservatives and the liberals. And here the purple nodes are the nodes in the, in the network that I showed you before, the ones that are sharing the misinformation. And you notice that most of them are on one side, right? Most of them are on the conservative side. This is because that particular uh, disinformation campaign was targeted at conservatives. It was, uh, it was leveraging pre-existing beliefs by conservatives about you know, the Obama administration doing evil things, spying on citizens and so on. And then it was merging that with these false claims about research um, um, you know, going on in our lab in this particular example. So the thing is that, oh, and one more thing, you can see two little orange dots on the left. It's kind of hard to see. Those were people actually sharing you know, the links to science and Columbia Journalism report, those reputable sources that were debunking this information. So what this says is that these echo chambers also have the, additional harm of shielding one from exposure to reliable information. Because you're gonna be targeted in one group or the other, and then you don't even know that there exists debunking information because it's, you're not exposed to it. It's, it's going to spread in the other community and very unlikely to spread in your own community. So this is one way in which echo chambers make us vulnerable. And although that was a few years ago, it's no different today. This is uh, more recent data from Twitter. And we can see that whether you look at the follower network at the top or the diffusion network, the retweet network at the bottom, we still have these highly segregated uh, and, and, um, and polarized uh, echo chamber structure on, on Twitter. 
and this is other people have shown similar <clears throat> similar dynamics uh, uh, on on other platforms as well. Now here, the size of the nodes here represents the fraction of links shared by uh, these users that are the go to low credibility sources. Okay, and so it actually turns out that most of the largest nodes are either on one side or the other. Few of them are sort of in the center. Well, there is very little center to start with. So this highlights another, uh, another point that in, the, in these parties and echo chambers, you have more prevalence of, uh, of low credibility information. Now, another way to look at it is through an experiment that we run recently. This is in a paper that just came out in Nature Communications. What we did to gauge um, you know, these echo chamber structure and also vulnerability to misinformation as well as other kinds of abuse without you know, taking out the confounding factors of humans themselves, because we are all, of course, we come in with our own biases. So what we try to do is take that out of the picture by creating some bots, okay? So we call these drifter bots, because these, the idea of these bots is that they kind of like drift at random in the currents of the information ecosystem. They follow a, a, a completely automated uh, algorithmic behavior that has no knowledge or understanding about content, about politics, nothing like that. They just follow people at random, retweet people at random, uh, tweet random things and so on. And all of them have the exact same, exact same behavior. Now, the only difference between these agents, it, these, these bots, these drifter bots, is where they start. Okay, so we had 15 of them. Three of them started by following one left-leaning news source. Three of them started following one center left-leaning. Three of them started following one center, which was USA Today, one center right, one right wing, okay? Um, so, so that's what you see here. Uh, each of these uh, little uh, ego networks is a sample of the ego networks of these agents after a while. And again, the only difference was the very first account that they started following. After that, they all did things completely at random and the behavior was exactly the same for all of them. So what you see is that they mostly tend to find themselves in these parties and echo chambers with some exceptions. Uh, so just based on where they start, if you start on the left, you end up being in a, in a conservative group. If you start on the right, you tend to be in a conservative group, uh, liberal, sorry, on the left. Uh, one exception, like uh, in the center right uh, group, which started by following the Wall Street Journal, you see that the one in the center is kind of like left leaning. Uh, this is interesting because at one point, uh, the drifter happened to randomly follow CNN. And CNN is a center left or uh, a source, um, at least this is how it is classified uh, currently based on um, our classification, which I'm happy to tell you more later if you have questions. Um, and so then it kind of swerved from the right to the left. But by and large, usually where you start has a big impact on where you find yourselves. Furthermore, then we looked at which, uh, how much low credibility information these drifters were exposed to. And here it's interesting because this is not a symmetric relationship. There is definitely more exposure to low credibility information among the drifters on the right than on the left. Uh, so this is something that has been found by other people as well. So uh, you know our findings simply reinforced uh, other findings by, by by other researchers in this sense that that there is a there is a uh, a greater vulnerability to low credibility information in the US on the right. Um, I see a hand up, so I'm Mike, I'm happy to take the question. Yeah, uh, it's a very short question, just uh, what is exactly the definition of low credibility link? Yes, excellent question. So um, it is difficult uh, to, you know, to fact check every single article from a source. And so one method that is increasingly used in a lot of the literature in this area is to look at sources. So um, for each source, you might have a uh, you might have a label, and low credibility. I use low credibility as a as an umbrella term to mean either that they post uh, fabricated false uh, false stories or hyper partisan, hyper biased content or conspiracy theories, 
or clickbait or junk science, for example, you know, like, uh, you know, natural news, which posts a lot of anti-vaccine information and so on and so forth. So we group these under the, the label of low credibility sources, and then we label every link from those sources as a low credibility article. Now, so, so, not so every article, sorry. So, so, sorry to interrupt. Uh, so is it, it is basically a, a, an expert opinion which, which goes into it to-, to Correct, to, to correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's not at the level of the article, it's the level of the source. Now, a, 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 a low credibility source might occasionally post a credible piece of information. I will give you one example. Uh, Breitbart, for example, very often simply does copy and paste of articles from other sources, for example, from CNN. Now, those articles all themselves might be accurate, but the bias in, is in the selection of articles. Only certain articles are published, those that help uh, support a particular point of view. So um, even though a particular article might, might it by itself uh, might appear uh, sort of credible, the, taken together, the articles from a particular source may be considered low credibility. Um, and likewise, you might have a credible source that occasionally posts something false. Now, the difference is that usually they post a correction, but you might have uh, something that we say, you know, this is a credible piece of information, whereas in fact, it may, uh, it may be misleading. So uh, um, there are false positives and false negatives in using this source-based approach, but it is uh, scalable and easy to do. So this is what many people do. Now, where does the label come from? You said expert sources. Uh, so that's true. Uh, there is multiple papers that have published uh, and as well as uh, fact-checking uh, organizations and some news organizations that publish lists of, of low credibility sources classified in different categories. There are also now available data from uh, organizations like NewsGuard, or there is also a free one called IFI+. They basically post scores for each news source where there are experts, either fact checkers or journalists, and journalists that look at a large numbers of articles from each source and classify them and then give a label to the source based on uh, you know, aggregate scores from, from these different articles. So we often use these kind of pre-existing third-party uh, rating systems. So media bias fact check is another one. Uh, there, is, there is a handful of these, of these sources that are used uh, widely in the literature. Thank you for asking that very important question. Um, so as I was saying here, you see that this vulnerability tends to be more uh, on the conservative side, and this has been shown by others. In another analysis, we uh, looked at a large number of accounts sharing specifically links to news, uh, not from our drifter bots, but just uh, sort of on a systematic uh, large scale sample from uh, uh, the Decahose, which is a 10% of all public tweets that we collect uh, here at IU. And here you can see on the X axis, you have the political um, alignment of an account, which can be calculated based on the links that they share, the source that they share, the hashtags that they use and so on. And on the Y axis, you see the portion of uh, low credibility links that they post. And you can see that there is a correlation both on the right and on the left. So it is not only conservatives that are vulnerable, also basically all partisans are more, more vulnerable. However, the correlation is much stronger on the right. So the relationship is not a symmetric one, at least for now, who knows, it might change in the future. So these are ways in which echo chambers make us vulnerable to misinformation, because if we, especially if we are in a partisan echo chamber, we, we are more likely exposed to low credibility information. We're not exposed to um, uh, different kinds of opinions, including fact-checking information. So that was number four, echo chambers. Number three is information overload. So when we look at a, the, the spread of a particular piece of fake news, uh, as in this particular case here, we can, we can map the diffusion network, okay? So in this particular case, uh, this is the diffusion network of this piece of fake news that you see on the bottom left. It was a false claim that the Clinton campaign was in, engaged in satanic rituals. It was a precursor to Pizzagate and later on to QAnon that you remember, but these, these, these stories were, had been around for a while. This was, as we could see, the most popular piece of misinformation spreading during the 2016 
uh, election. It came from Infowars, a well-known conspiracy theory website that was years later suspended by all major um, social media platforms. So this in this network here, every link is every every node is a, a Twitter account, and every link is a retweet of this particular article. So you can immediately observe just by the structure of the network that some nodes are much more influential than others. And that's not surprising. These big nodes here, these are probably Alex Jones uh, or associated with, uh, with the source Infowars itself. But you also see that uh, and the blue and the blue links are you know, mostly regular Twitter users, the blue nodes, sorry. Uh, and then you see a bunch of red nodes kind of like towards the periphery, but they are also pretty influential. You can see that many, uh, users are exposed to this piece of fake news through these intermediaries. So the color red here represents the likelihood that an account is automated or a social bot. And I'll talk a lot more later about social bots because we do a lot of research on that. But this is in the meanwhile to you know plant the seed in your in your mind that that that's one kind of manipulation. But here we're talking about information overload. So can we identify some of the cognitive vulnerabilities that lead some pieces of disinformation like this one to go viral? And what do I mean by viral? Okay, if you look at the distribution of popularity of a piece of information, it could be a hashtag, it could be a link to a news uh, article, like in this particular case, it could be a phrase or whatever, uh, you tend to see that this distribution is very broad. It spans multiple orders of magnitude. And the majority of memes or articles, whatever, don't go very viral at all. But a few go very viral, and that's shown by this long tail towards the right. So this particular example here, this particular fake news item, was shared 30, more than 30,000 times on Twitter. So it, it, it's represented by the tail of the, this distribution. And so this is the typical statistical signature of virality, this broad distribution that spans many orders of magnitude. So how can we reproduce this kind of, of distribution? And by the way, notice that for uh, the distribution for low credibility sources, which are labeled claims here, and for fact checking reliable sources here, the distributions are very, very similar, but uh, the low credibility information has an even longer tail. So some pieces of, of uh, low credibility news go even more viral than others. And this has been also shown by uh, several other people. So what are the factors that predict this kind of broad uh, distribution? So we ran another experiment, uh, sorry, another model like the one I showed you before, but in this case, the, the network is not changing. Uh, and just like I said before, people are either posting new things or reposting what is posted by their friends, but um, they see these things in a feed just like before, but here we have uh, uh, two more two ingredients that we're exploring. One is the structure of the network, uh, which can be random like we see, saw before, but it could also look like a social network. For example, it might have high clustering coefficient or the presence of hubs. These are characteristics of real social networks. And the other one is that agents have finite attention. So when they scroll through their, their feed, uh, they may only go so deep, okay? So after a while they stop. So when they reshare something, it's only among the things that they, that they have seen, of course. So how does this affect the distribution of popularity? So it turns out that with two ingredients, you can reproduce this broad distribution of, of popularity, this viral dynamics. And the two ingredients is one, the structure of the network. So it has to look like a social network. Like I said before, it has to have high clustering and hubs. Otherwise you don't get that broad distribution. And number two, you must have limited attention. If you allow agents to see everything before they decide what to share, actually you don't see this, this uh, law, power law-like broad distribution. So with these two ingredients, uh, the, the, the social network that looks like social network and the fact that we have finite attention, which is true of us and our, uh, and our social networks, inevitably you get that some stuff is going to go viral. Now notice in, in this model, there's no notion of quality, okay? Everything that is spreading is just like a random number, okay? So the things that go viral are not necessarily good in any sense. In other words, it's inevitable that some things is gonna go viral, irrespective of quality. That's what this model says. With this, if you have information sharing on a social networks with finite attention, some stuff is gonna go viral.
Uh, it could be junk, it could be good, who knows? Um, so I think there is a, a hand up, uh, a question, Mark? Yeah, I have a question. It's, it's basically, you, you mentioned about the, the scroll feed, but the algorithm of a scrolling feed on the social network now is very manipulated. Yes, and and this is actually, I think, the the chicken and egg problem now. I think this this is not like when you were in the systems of of um, blogs and RSS that was linear, but yeah. but now it, it, this is AI and um, many other things there which are manipulating the the people basically. You're absolutely right, and in fact, that's a great segue because my next my, my next item is about engagement, and I'm going to talk about the ranking algorithm itself. So I'm going to get and talk about that. Thank you. Uh, in this model, however, this is a simplified model that does not have any ranking. So you're absolutely right; it's not realistic in that sense. But that's the whole point, right? I'm showing you different models to show you how whether you can explain some things without having to use more sophisticated models. And then what are the consequences of using sophi more sophisticated models that capture other things like ranking? So I'm gonna mm -hmm. get to that. Uh, at this stage here, uh, there is no ranking. So this is a very, very simple model. It's the only thing that it captures is finite attention. Uh, yes, Max. Um, I'm I'm quite curious about um, so Lada Adamich had similar results right regarding cascades of photos on Facebook, and they they sort of surmise at some point they say this broad distribution looks like a Euler Simon distribution and that there's a sign uh, sort of a uh, a kind of uh, hallmark of evolution, and so you you have some limiting factor here like selection which is limited attention. And you have some variation factor in here, which is sort of the spread on the social network, whatever that means. Um, would you subscribe to something like that? Are memes and uh, whatever spreads on the social network evolving? And uh, is, 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 is Infowars just an accident that uh, basically, um, you know, like in evolution, sometimes the not so awesome stuff wins out? Well, uh, evolution assumes that there is random variation and there is selection. In some sense, that's true. Uh, but uh, you know, you know, in, you can also drive evolution in some sense, right? Through through select selection, of course, not only by selection or selection, you know, of the fit, uh, survival of the fittest, but you can actually <laughs> select, like we do this with 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 many animals and. Uh, agriculture and so on. So in this case, I think there is both. I think there is both uh, a sense in which the things that are popular are going to spread more because they're more interesting perhaps, or because they leverage some inner, um, you know, ingredient of attention that, you know, it could be because they make us angry and et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole discussion to go there. But then there is also the fact that people actually optimize for that. Mm -hmm. So when you, you can do A-B testing, if you are InfoWars, you can test, you can write the same article with different headlines and see which one goes more viral. This is done by, uh, this is done a lot, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and in fact, clickbait is, uh, you know, we were talking about clickbait earlier, that this is an example of that, right? Trying to tune the title, or it could be for a video, it could be for a picture, it could be for an article, just to get people to, uh, you know, to react to it and pay more attention. This is done a lot. It could be also done with malicious intent. It could be done mm -hmm. for the purpose of spreading misinformation. So there is a, um, I think there is a combination here of sort of natural evolution type kind of dynamics, mm -hmm. uh, memetics, together with bad actors that are specifically trying to game this system in various ways. And I'm going to talk more about different different ways. So, uh, but just you know, fast forward a little bit. I'll tell you about bots. Bots can make it look like more people are engaged with some narrative, which it will then trick uh, people to pay more attention to it because we think that if other people are paying attention, it must be interesting. That's a, a classic, you know, like a instinct that we have, a cognitive bias, and plus the algorithms themselves also pay attention to that. 
uh, and so then themselves they can get tricked. So I'm going to talk more about that. But yes, in the sense that there is a natural dynamics probably, but there is also a lot of uh, exploitation of that. Uh, so I'm kind of going in steps to show how all of these vulnerabilities can be exploited. So, uh, all right, so let me, uh, so I'll continue here. So again, in this particular uh, simple model, there was no notion of quality, right? Um, but now another objection that you guys might make is, well, but you know, I don't just click things at random. Uh, I am more likely to click and pay attention to and share things that I'm interested in that I think are more interesting or higher quality. So we can now add that ingredient to this model. So let's imagine that each piece of information being shared in the network has an intrinsic quality to it. And let's further imagine that agents can recognize that quality and that the probability of sharing something is proportional to its quality. And now this quality can be generated by from a, some distribution. I, I won't go into the details un, unless you wanna ask more later. So what do we observe? Now, what, now we expect that there should be a correlation between virality and quality, right? The stuff that is higher quality should be picked up more and therefore be more likely to become viral. And that is the situation in the case of low information overload. So in the case that uh, what that people are able to see most of the stuff out there, okay? But in the case, so that's what represented by the network on the left here, by the way, the size of the nodes represent the quality of the information that they're sharing. So you see all these big nodes on the left. These, these, that, that means that most people are sharing a few high quality pieces of information. But as you now add the ingredient of finite attention so that there is more information out there and you can only look at a fraction of it before you decide what to share. Now you get a more realistic situation of information overload and you see the network on the right where there is a lot more information that is spreading. The memes that are being, that are share, being shared are more diverse from each other, but they tend to be lower quality. Okay, you see a lot of these small nodes. So in other words, even though people can tell what's higher quality and prefer to share that, still a lot of low quality stuff will spread. So junk will spread virally. And in this case, the correlation between quality and virality is very, very low. So again, even if you assume that people prefer to share good stuff, still a lot of low credibility stuff, will, low quality stuff will, will, will go around. So this is, this is another ingredient that we need to put in our recipe for, you know, for disaster, <laughs> the presence of echo chambers, and now also the fact that we have limited attention. Now, the next one, number two, is bias on the side of the platform. Now, there may be many different kinds of bias uh, that are discussed all the time. For example, we've, we've all heard claims that platforms have a liberal bias. We actually explore this claim uh, using the drifter bots that I told you about before. And it turns out that we did find political bias, but uh, it's a conservative bias, not a liberal bias. But it's not really driven by the platform itself. It's driven by the information ecosystem. L let me explain. On the left, uh, we have over time, uh, the uh, home timeline, uh, uh, the, the, the political alignment of the links or, ha or hashtags in the fee in the uh, uh, home timeline of the drifter bots, okay? So basically what they were exposed to. And you can see that the drifters who started on the left kind of tend to drift towards the center, whereas the ones who started on the right, they stay on the right. And furthermore, if you see what the bots themselves are posting, this is the user timeline, you see the plot in the center. And again, you see that the, the drifters on the left kind of drift towards the center. The ones on the right, if anything, can tend to drift even to the right. So this is why we say that there is a conservative bias. But is it coming from the platform where this is very hard to measure? Because uh, as Mar said earlier, the, the algorithm might play a role. But in this particular experiment, we did not have access to the ranking algorithm of the platform because it is not available through the API. So all we could do is rank by, uh, by time. And if we did that, we did not observe a bias in, 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 in the sense that we did not observe a difference in the political alignment 
of the links and the hashtag posted by a drifter's friends and what they saw in their own timeline. That's what's shown in the rightmost plot, the difference between the home timeline and what is posted by the friends, the friends user timelines. So in other words, if you, if you, if you see things ranked uh, you know, by, by time, uh, you basically don't see a, a, a political bias. However, there, was, there is a recent article that I just saw that is not uh, published yet. I just saw a, a preprint by a bunch of people at Twitter, actually, who did this analysis looking at the ranking algorithm. And of course, they have access to the ranking algorithm because they are at Twitter. And they have actually found that there is a conservative bias in the ranking algorithm. So in other words, uh, the ranking algorithms is more likely to rank higher content that is of a conservative nature. Now, they don't necessarily put the political alignment as an ingredient to their, to their algorithm. Um, so, you know, their article does not say why this, this bias exists, just that, uh, just that it does exist. But it is not too difficult to guess as to the reason. And the reason is that the algorithm tries to predict what's engaging and to rank higher engaging content. And we know that machine learning algorithms can be very, very good at, uh, at identifying engaging content. And it's, it turns out based on uh, our own analysis with the drifters, that the content on the right is much more engaging. Uh, people are much more active on the right. There is more tweets, more retweets and so on. So this is one kind of bias, it's political bias. But now let's, let me switch to engagement bias, which goes back towards what Mar was asking a few minutes ago. So uh, the algorithms actually are ranking things. Uh, in a, a, and so we wanted to look at what might be the effect of that ranking. We assume that that ranking is based in large part on engagement because this has been reported widely. So we now modify the, the, the model uh, well, or we have a new version of the model that has this ingredient. So in other words, uh, things are ranked in the feed based on combination of two factors. One factor is quality. Let's assume that the platform can have some estimate of quality as has been reported, for example, recently by the Facebook whistleblower. And the ranking by quality actually was emphasized during the elections and then de-emphasized before and after uh, because uh, you know, because then there is less engagement and then the platform makes less money. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, the, the algorithm here as a combination of quality and popularity, okay? Uh, now, you could, you could say that there is good reason for this. You could say that if the algorithm doesn't know if some new piece of information is, uh, is good or bad, but if a lot of people are sharing, probably there is something to it that makes it interesting. This is sort of the, you know, the wisdom of the crowd. So let's see what happens in the algorithm here. We ran, we ran it with uh, different com uh, uh, some combination of, po of popularity and quality, which is shown on the x-axis. And then we measured the average quality of all the information that is spreading in the system. That's on the z and the z-axis. And what you see is that as you have more uh, popularity bias, so more, you know, you give more weight to ranking by engagement the lower the average quality of information in the system. Now, there is a narrow, uh, the narrow region here along the attention uh, uh, dimension here where you see this yellow area. So here you see that for some low values of, of probability of selecting things by, uh, by popularity, something around, let's say, 0.2 or 0.3 or 0.4, actually the overall quality grows. That's a signature of the wisdom of the crowd, okay? This is the narrow region in which you, people choose things by quality. You notice that you as the algorithm notice that pattern and you amplify it. And in this way, you can more quickly detect the, the quality information. But it's a very small effect and only appears in a very narrow range of attention in general. Uh, and even, even in that case, as you give more and more attention to engagement, the quality uh, goes down. So this is a demonstration about how en uh, engagement bias in the ranking algorithm tends to suppress quality. So this is a little bit going towards what Mar was, was asking earlier. Now, this is from the point of view of the platform, 
Okay, what about the users themselves? Because we are also influenced by, by impressions of virality, right? If you see that a video on YouTube has been seen a hundred million times, it's very hard to resist, resist the temptation to watch it, right? And so we wanted to run an experiment about how that particular point would affect our vulnerability to low credibility information. And to do that, we used an app called Fakey that we developed in our lab. It's a game that simulates your news feed on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, and it's meant to be, uh, you know, a literacy, a literacy game to, to encourage people to pay attention to sources and be careful about what they share. So people see a feed of current news. Some of them are from mainstream sources. Some of them are from low credibility sources. And they have to decide whether to share something or like it or label it for fact checking. And they get points for doing the right thing, which is sharing things from uh, you know, credible sources and labeling for fact checking things from low credibility sources. But uh, in this uh, game, we also ran an experiment because we tell people how many people how many other people have liked or shared a piece of news. And this is a control variable, okay? It's a random variable drawn by a power law distribution. Uh, and so people may see a large number, a small number. And then what we notice then is that people are more likely to share low credibility articles when they get the impression that that article has been liked or shared by many other people. And likewise, the players are less likely to fact check low credibility articles when they think that those articles have been liked or shared by many people. So the mere exposure to these popularity signals make us vulnerable, okay? We use basically signals about other people to decide whether we should pay attention to something or not. So this is another vulnerability because of course, you can game this, right? You can create fake accounts, you can create coordinated campaigns to make it look like there's a lot of engagement in something. And so now you're tricking, as I was saying earlier, you're tricking both the algorithm and you're tricking the users at the same time. It's a double whammy. So let's talk about manipulation. And this is number one in my, in my list. Uh, <clears throat> and this, you know, a lot of the research that goes on in our lab is, is, um, is about how social media platforms and its users can be manipulated. We've studied social bots for many, many years. In fact, we actually coined the term social bots uh, over 10 years ago. And uh, this is the instance in which we identified the first social bots and, and, and call them that. Uh, the example on the right here is these two accounts that share, it, uh, retweet each other many, many times. So the blue, uh, uh, the blue there is a link, and we, um, you know, we wanted to visualize the diffusion of information, and um, and uh, uh, blue meant retweets, and the weight of the edge was proportional to the number of retweets between two users, and we got this plot, and we thought it was an error, right? We saw this all this blue, like we thought there was a bug in the code. And then eventually we realized, no, it was not a bug because these two accounts were retweeting each other tens of thousands of times in a very short period of time. And so we realized, okay, these were actually not real people. These were accounts that were just automatically posting thousands of times a day. And they were supporting a particular candidate, which is the node uh, on the left. So one account was mentioning that candidate and then the, the other one was retweeting and then they were retweeting each other. And this was all done to boost the popularity of that candidate and to make him go trending, which they succeeded at. And another example of bots that we discovered back then uh, was bots that were colluding with each other. They were controlled by a single entity uh, trying to push actually fake news. So they were controlled by a person who ran a fake news website. And then what he would do is he, he had a bunch of fake Twitter accounts that, um, that impersonated churches. They, they, were, they were fake, but they claimed to be churches. And then what they would do is that at the, all at the same time, they would post a link to one of the fake articles on the website. And in doing that, they would also mention an influential person, like a journalist or a politician. And that's the node in the center. The node in the center is not part of the network. It's a target. And the hope, of course, was that this person then would retweet 
the articles and make it go viral. And sometimes they were, they were successful. Uh, so this is one early, uh, these are two early examples of, of, of how social bots were used. One is to flood the network and, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's simulate uh, some kind of uh, grassroots campaign to make it look like someone or something is popular when they're not. And the second one is to target an influential to get them to, um, to share something in this particular, some fake news. Uh, so uh, we built a system to try and track uh, the spread of low credibility information. The system is called Hoxie and it's available for anyone. It allows you to visualize the network, uh, the diffusion network for um, articles from low credibility fact-checking sources or even anything that is spreading on Twitter uh, in real time. And we reconstructed the aggregate network of a lot of pieces of misinformation and fact-checking information during the 2016 election. And here you see another example of an echo chamber here. In purple, this is spread of low credibility links. In orange, spread of um, fact-checking links. And you can see that the people who are most vulnerable to low credibility information tend to follow each other. Uh, and and uh, and of course not are less likely to ship, to follow or to mention or to link to um, more credible sources. Furthermore, as we dive into the core of this low credibility uh, network, we find a higher presence of bots. Um, and so I'll tell you more about how we detect these bots. But in, for now, take my word: the bot score is. Think of it as a score such that if it's higher, you're more likely to be automated. And so on average, the accounts in this sort of core of the misinformation network are, you know, there is, the high, there is a, a likelihood of larger number of automated accounts. So that's how you can manipulate, of course, people who are vulnerable to misinformation. In fact, with our drifters, we looked at it and we found that uh, you know, all of these drifters um, uh, had um, a lot of bot followers, but it turns out that the drifters in the, that were in the partisan, uh, on the partisan sides were more likely themselves to follow uh, likely bots uh, on the left and on the right. And so what, what do these bots do? Um, well, I mentioned earlier, one technique is to target an influential, uh, an influential node. So uh, the plot on the top left tells us that in general, the more you're likely to be automated, the more you're likely to mention a, a user with many, many followers. And a, an example of this is the yellowed node that you see in this network here. So this was a bot, uh, it was very clever. Um, it, what it did, do, this was uh, right after the end of, the, right after the 2016 election, there was a uh, fake news article in Infowars that claimed that 3 million votes uh, in the presidential election had been cast by illegal aliens. And this is why uh, Trump had lost the uh, popular vote to Clinton. And so what this bot did is that every time a mainstream news source like New York Times, you can see here CNN, uh, The Economist, BBC, and so on, every time that they mentioned Donald Trump, this bot would reply with a link to that low credibility article, that claim from Infowars, okay? And it did this systematically, hundreds of times. So what happened then is that Trump would see that new sources were talking about him in the context of the link to this article. And so this was obviously done in an effort to expose the president that had been just elect been elected uh, to this piece of fake news. And sure enough, sometime later, Trump actually claimed that this was a fact and said uh, in response to journalists that he had read it in an article online. And we searched exhaustively. The only article that made this claim was this false news article from Infowars, which claimed as its source an anonymous Twitter account that had already been suspended by Twitter. So it was completely fabricated. And, um, and so here's an example of how targeting might work. Another interesting observation uh, is that if you, if you look at who's sharing a piece of misinformation when it's gone viral, you don't really see the presence of bots because by then lots of humans have shared it. But what we can do is sort of rewind time and see 
who was sharing that piece of local reliability information in the first few seconds. And when you do that, you find the presence of likely bots. You see the average bot score shoots high within the first few seconds. So these are those red circles that I showed you at the very beginning, remember? Those are the automated accounts that are amplifying uh, local reliability information. They're getting many humans exposed. Once the use humans start sharing, then you don't see you don't see anymore the presence uh, or, or the role of those bots. And the final thing is, of course, that these bots, what they do is flooding, okay? They can post, a, a single account can post the same link to the same local readability article thousands of times, even tens of thousands of times we are finding now. And uh, since then, Twitter put a limit on the number of posts per day by an account. And we find that accounts can circumvent that limit by posting and then deleting content. And in so doing, they can go around this limit. And this is a paper under review right now. Uh, but we find that accounts are, are able to post hundreds of thousands of times a day uh, versus the limit of Twitter is 2,400. Um, so the, this is the idea of flooding. So what does that do? Well, if we look at retweets, of local readability information, you see that most of those retweets come from humans. Uh, see on the x-axis, you have the bot score of the retweeter. And when you project onto that axis, you find most of the retweets originate from likely humans. But then if we look at who those humans are, are retweeting, so if you focus on the, you know, on, on the, on the low uh, part of the x-axis, and then, and then you project on the y-axis, now you find who, who was the originator of the tweet that is being reshared by these humans. And you see that some, most of them are humans, but many of them are also bots. So in other words, bots can get humans to retweet low credibility content by exposure. And we've seen this in many, many domains. Uh, in fact, as you know, even going far back in 2014, there was a lot of debate about vaccine, not the COVID vaccines that we're talking about now, but at that time, it was debate about uh, COVID for, um, you know, for measles and so on. And a lot of that conversation was dominated by accounts that, um, that we labeled as highly automated. And then later on, a colleague um, uh, found that most of them were controlled by accounts uh, run from Russia, from the, um, from the IRA. So, um, so, so this is, these are ways in which automated accounts can sort of, um, you know, abuse and, and manipulate the system. But it's not only bots, okay? So, for example, look at this account, okay? If you look at this account, you can tell that this is a human. There is no automation here. There is a person here who's posting anti-Trump content. And so you might say, okay, so maybe this is an activist, uh, big deal. But now, if I show you that there is a whole bunch of other accounts that are all very, very similar to this one using similar images, similar pattern, basically they're using a template, they're creating websites and, and so on. And look, some are anti-Trump and some are pro-Trump. And so what these accounts were doing, uh, actually what this person or single actor uh, was doing was controlling these accounts, claiming uh, going to conservatives saying we are an anti-Trump uh, group, going, sorry, going to conservatives and say we are a pro-Trump group, going to liberals say we're anti-Trump group, and then collect money, saying that they were collecting money for the campaign. So it was just a case of fraud. So this is a very important way that, uh, of manipulating the system that is not using bots, but it's just using a bunch of accounts controlled by a human. So all the content is posted by a human, but, but uh, the human controlled these different accounts. So it's a single actor. Uh, so we developed uh, methods to detect these kind of coordinated campaigns. Um, and so here in this particular case, uh, the clusters here of the same color, these are accounts that uh, are basically colluding by sharing uh, Twitter handles, okay? They, they, they swap handles, and this is done in a way to avoid detection. So an account might post something and then before uh, uh, that violates the terms of service, and then before Twitter decides whether to suspend them, they swap handles. And we've seen this used to uh, by accounts that spread misinformation. So this is how we found those accounts that I showed you earlier. 
Um, but uh, we don't see it only on Twitter. We see it only also on Facebook. Uh, so here, for example, are accounts, coordinated accounts on uh, uh, coordinated Facebook pages that share uh, low credibility information about, uh, about COVID, misinformation about COVID. Uh, here are uh, accounts that we detected because they're sharing the exact same images or nearly identical images, long sequences of these images, so that it's very unlikely to happen by chance. And these were used to influence uh, uh, the, the Hong Kong, uh, the online uh, debate about the Hong Kong protests, and they were used both pro and anti Hong Kong protests. Uh, we also saw accounts that were coordinated by uh, retweeting the same uh, content uh, in the context of the Syria's uh, civil war, and these were done either to uh, these were done often to attack uh, the white helmets in Syria. Um, we also noticed accounts that are coordinated by tweeting at the same time. So this is uh, uh, this is synchrony type of coordination, and this is done in uh, uh, pump and dump schemes to basically to manipulate the cryptocurrency market. Okay, so basically a bunch of bots that are controlled by a few actors uh, post uh, all at the same time about some cryptocurrency coin to get uh, the price to go up because people pay attention to, uh, to this chatter online, uh, some investors do. And then once it reaches a certain uh, price, then they sell. And, and, and so this is a kind, of, a kind of fraud that is actually very, very common. And, uh, and, that we, and we found this kind of coordination. And then of course there is political, uh, you know, political uh, coordination. Uh, sometimes this is done by teens that are paid or by people who are paid uh, as in the case of a bunch of teens that were paid by a pro-Trump um, youth group uh, to post misinformation about uh, the elections and about COVID. And sometimes this is done by people who just donate their Twitter uh, password to an app that then posts on their behalf. And this is the case of these clusters on the left. And uh, there are, some of them were pro-Trump, some of them were, were anti-Trump, but we detected them because they were posting the exact same content, long, long sequences of messages using the same hashtags, uh, the same sequences of hashtags. Uh, and so what's the harm of these coordinated campaigns? So we build a, another version of our model uh, to look at that. And in this case, we looked at infiltration as one of the, of the key components. So here, the yellow accounts are the coordinated and they're trying to spread low credibility information in the system. The gray uh, nodes are humans and darker color here means uh, low credibility. So if you know, the coordinated accounts are kind of peripheral, they can't do much damage. But if they can infiltrate the network, they can do a lot of damage. They, dri they can drive uh, the quality down by getting humans to retweet low credibility information. So this is another way in which models can, can help us. Yes, Max. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, all, the, all the things you're enumerating, right? Like synchronization, same images, similar types of images and stuff like that. They're all spotable, but uh, there, I assume there is some kind of gradient going on because uh, the absolute art form, just like an art forgery, would be to sort of drown in noise and basically um, leave all traces behind. So how much of that do you think is actually not detectable? I personally think that there is a lot that is not detectable. I think that what we're finding is the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. We're finding the things that are most obvious. And also when eventually Twitter wises up to these things and they get better at detecting bots. And then, you know, of course the attacks become more sophisticated. We've, we've seen this in the past. Twitter has become much more aggressive in detecting bots. And now we don't see these kind of simple bots anymore. But we do see a lot of this coordination where there are people who are paid, sometimes in developing countries, they're paid to stare at the screen and retweet things thousands of times. We also find new kinds of manipulation, for example, fostering the creation of these parties and echo chambers through so-called Twitter, uh, um, so-called so um, follow trains. And then we see deletion, like I mentioned before. Uh, this is the, our latest find, is that deletions are used en masse. There are accounts that post tens of thousands of tweets per day and then delete all of them. So basically, 
once the damage is done, once somebody has been exposed to that content, then the content goes away. And this stuff is very difficult to police because Twitter introduced this concept of deletion and either require, even requires researchers like us to delete all the content that has been deleted by the user so that we can't do research on the deleted content. So our analysis was based only on, on the metadata. Uh, and so it does this to honor people's privacy. P people may have good reasons to want to delete their tweets, right? Perhaps you, mm -hmm. you, know, you made a mistake or you don't want to share. That's perfectly reasonable. But we find that this is weaponized by bad actors who do it systematically in high volume. And so they can get, they can trick the ranking algorithms, get some content to go up by posting it. And then there is, here's another thing that we just found. Uh, and then there is a bunch of accounts that like and unlike the same content, literally hundreds of times in a very short time. This is clearly done to trick the ranking algorithms to so that more people are exposed to that content, okay? Mm -hmm. And then it's all deleted mm -hmm. within the day. So that, you know, whatever damage was done is done, whatever, you know, people have, who have been exposed have been exposed and then it's all gone. So there's no trace. Oh. We, we are required to delete all that data from our, from our collection. So we cannot analyze the deleted content. So, so yes, to, in answer to your question, yeah, uh, a lot of it is hard to detect. Uh, the, the more, you know, it's an arms race. If you, if you build better detection algorithms, then, uh, then the attacker will build better uh, evading algorithms. But of course, you know, the good, you know, the good side of it is that the cost is going up. It, it, it's, it becomes more difficult to do this kind of manipulation. And so, you know, uh, eventually, you know, fewer actors are able to do it. Fewer actors have the resources, the skills to do it. And so the arms race, you know, in some sense could also lead to an overall improvement of the situation. Uh, kind of like spam, right? Uh, you know, Spam, there's still a lot of email spam, but most of it is detected quickly by the platforms. And so it doesn't do as much harm anymore. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a, an ongoing arms race. Yes. Is, uh, is this a good moment to, there's, uh, Piotr has posted three questions in the chat in the last half hour. So maybe- uh, Absolutely a good it. moment. Let me just say then what I was gonna do next is just give a brief overview of some tools. Um, yes. uh, so I, that's is, is a very good breaking moment. Piotr, uh, you wanna raise one of your questions or? Okay. We can we can read oh, them. I, I, oh. I think first of all, have some the problems with sound. You probably no. have to, to read those. Okay. So I, okay, I have to read them. Okay, because of the sound. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Let me start with the one um, um, the, one of the recent ones. Have you also studied uh, or considered TikTok or an, uh, and other solutions? It seems that young people are not into Twitter and other solutions like that. So basically the, the question yeah. is at a platforms, basically. Very, very good question. And unfortunately, uh, although we would love to study TikTok as well as other platforms, the data is not available at all. So the reason why many, many researchers, including us, focus on Twitter is purely because data is more easily available on Twitter. Um, now, we recently did a study on COVID vaccine misinformation comparing Twitter and Facebook. We found similar techniques of abuse. Uh, however, we found that people were amplifying not necessarily the same content. So different sources were more active on the different platforms. But in both platforms, we found that uh, most of the misinformation was concentrated around a few major actors. So uh, people refer to these as super spreaders. Uh, so these are very often um, accounts that are um, verified by both platforms. Uh, and, and they are responsible for the sharing of large portion of low credibility information. So in this sense, these two different platforms are similar, although the content may not be exactly the same. Um, so this makes us believe that 
probably if you're going to do some kind of attack and you have the resources, by attack, I mean very generally any kind of manipulation like spreading misinformation or trolling or you know pump and dump scheme, whatever it is, um, you probably are going to target all the platforms that you are able to target. And most platforms offer APIs that allow to do this. So my guess is that the same kind of abuse and manipulation happens on different platforms, but it is easier for us to detect it, on, detect it and study it on Twitter because, because the data is much more easily available to us. Now, uh, Facebook does make some data available to some research through CrowdTangle, uh, which, which we also have access to, although the future of this tool is a little uncertain. There is some discussion that, that Facebook might want to de-emphasize that. The whole CrowdTangle team, for example, has been reassigned and uh, the person who started CrowdTangle that has been acquired by Facebook has left the company. So we'll see what happens. But to the extent that data is available for analysis uh, on Facebook, uh, we find similar patterns. But um, so hopefully it's like a canary, you know, Twitter gives us a way to detect some abusive patterns and then maybe those patterns are present in other platforms as well. Uh, but there may be differences because, you know, mechanisms may be somewhat different, different ranking algorithms may be somewhat different. Uh, so, yeah, so of course we are very, very limited um, and, you know, some platforms are more opaque than others and uh, TikTok is completely opaque. The only study that I've seen of TikTok is, was done uh, by a bunch of people who crawled, uh, crawled the website. Um, and so, you know, sometimes data can be available in that way. For example, there is a volunteer who crawls uh, Reddit mm -hmm. and makes that data available to the public through an API. Um, so, you know, we look at any platforms that we can get our hands on the data, whether it's uh, Twitter, uh, Reddit, Facebook, etc. But uh, some platforms are completely opaque. So that's Jason Baumgartner, I assume, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. So is it how, how, how as, a, as a researcher is in that field, like how does it feel that like everything depends on another person that's like Aaron Schwartz? <laughs> Um, yeah, and like what, like what should be a public good? Is, is that crazy or? It, it is crazy. In fact, there is a lot of effort right now and a lot of conversations among misinformation researchers about trying to convince platforms to share more data. Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter for has been, you know, you know, it's not per, far from, from perfect. Uh, you know, it, it, there is a lot of abuse there, which we often point out. But from the point of view of sharing data with researchers, it's probably the best citizen. Uh, in fact, re recently they've even improved. They, they, you know, they now have academic access, which gives um, uh, people uh, access to much larger volume of data than than before. Uh, Facebook is a mixed bag. The CrowdTangle is a very important resource. Uh, we don't know whether it will stay. Uh, they recently announced that they will make, uh, they will reactivate the page API, which used to be active before the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and then it was shut down. Um, they've announced it, but uh, we'll see if, if this really happens. Uh, but uh, a lot of people feel that it's not good to have to be dependent on, you know, on the platform's own uh, preferences because they may be biased. And sometimes the data that they share maybe bias. For example, uh, recently we learned that the data shared by Facebook with the Social Science One uh, initiative uh, was, was very incomplete. And a lot of uh, research from using that data uh, was invalid because of that. Uh, so there is a big uh, emphasis right now in trying to come up with regulation that would uh, force platforms to share data with researchers in some way, using some mechanism, perhaps using a federal agency to be uh, as an in-between. So that the data would not be shared with the government, it would be shared with researchers, but there would be a way to vet researchers to make sure that they're bona fide researchers, not like it happened with Cambridge Analytica, where researchers then gave the data to, uh, to Cambridge Analytica. Mm -hmm. um, and Nate Persley, for example, at Stanford is one, one of the people who are very actively engaged in in pushing for this kind of legislation. He even wrote a bill uh, 
-hmm. and recently testified in Congress on the need uh, to, sh to, to compel uh, platforms to share data. And there is a very lively debate among people like myself and, and many others in, in this area uh, about, you know, what data should be shared, how should be shared, uh, mm -hmm. what would be the mechanism, what would be the, the vetting uh, intermediaries and, and so on and so forth. There, there are several people who work on policy um, at, at George Washington University, for example, Rebecca Trumbull is another researcher who's very active in, in this particular area, both in the US and in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it, you're right, uh, it's a very important thing and, and it's not ideal to have depend to have to depend either on the platform's goodwill or on volunteers like Jason. And hopefully, uh, in the future, the, the situation will improve. But uh, we'll see. Interesting. So uh, maybe we should we should uh, continue the tour through the tools. Yes, I'll, I'll go very I'll, I'll I'll go very quickly. Um, so everybody can is welcome to visit the page of the Observatory on social media and to play with our tools. They're all available over there. I'll just mention a few. Bottometer is what we use to detect social bots. I mentioned it earlier. It's basically a machine learning algorithm that takes uh, thousands of, well, over a thousand um, features, extracts over a thousand features about an account, its tweets, its friends, followers, and so on and then uh, uses labeled examples in a supervised learning framework to come up with a score. Uh, and, uh, and so it's, it's, it's freely available to researchers and it's used a lot and you can play with it. Uh, another tool I mentioned earlier is Hoxie. Hoxie is a visualization tool. Um, you can either just search things on Twitter live and then visualize the diffusion network, or we also monitor a bunch of low credibility sources and, and uh, extract all the tweets that have links to their articles so that you can use it as a search engine and find articles that match some query and then see how those articles have been uh, uh, spreading in the past. And the tool is, um, in, uh, is um, integrated with Bottometer so that you can see what is the role of automated accounts, for example, in sharing some piece of information, as you can see here. Um, this, you know, you can find an account that is likely a bot as here, and then you can see, you know, what is, what are they posting, who's reposting them and so on. And uh, um, one of our um, uh, more recent tools, this is under active development, is called Bot Slayer. The idea here is to allow anyone to set up their own infrastructure in the cloud to monitor tweets uh, of interest. And uh, this, uh, this tool extracts um, uh, entities from these tweets, for example, hashtags, phrases, links, uh, and so on. And then for each of them looks at what is the likelihood that this particular entity is being amplified by uh, likely bots. Uh, this is integrated with a fast version of Bot Botometer called Botometer Lite, developed by my student Kevin Yang. Um, and also it, it uses the coordination algorithm, one version of the coordination algorithm that I showed you earlier to see whether it's likely that different coordinated accounts may be, uh, may be pushing for something. Um, so the idea is to make it easier to, for, for anybody to do this own analysis on, on their own by using this tool. So here, for example, is a visualization from Hoxie that shows a particular uh, uh, a particular entity, this was a link to a YouTube video that was a fake news video that was attacking a particular target, Bill Browder, for those of you who know who that is. Uh, and uh, in real time, uh, you know, the, the, the system found uh, lots of bots. These were Russian bots that were amplifying this, this fake news video. And uh, within seconds, those accounts were suspended by Twitter. So we know that Twitter is, is very active and quick in removing this kind of, um, you know, this kind of amplification, but our system de de detected them in, in in real time. So, so this is a tool that we, you know, we hope it can be useful to journalists, uh, civil society organizations, uh, as well as researchers. And then finally, the last uh, the last of our, our tools is called Covaxi. Uh, this is a, a dashboard that helps people visualize the relationship between the spread of low credibility information about COVID vaccines and uh, outcomes such as vaccination rates or vaccine hesitancy uh, at the ge geographic level, for example, in different US states. And we find that there is a very strong correlation 
between uh, vaccination rates, for example, or vaccine hesitancy and prevalence of misinformation about vaccines, both at the state and at the county level. So I'm gonna, so this is available also for anybody who wants to play with it and all the data is, is available. So I'll stop here just to summarize um, uh, the points that I was, that I wanted to share with you today is that the interplay of cognitive, social and algorithmic biases make us vulnerable to misinformation and bad actors actually exploit these vulnerabilities. And tools to study information diffusion networks, bots, coordinated influence campaigns, can help us understand and counter such manipulation of, of the information ecosystem. Here's a shameless plug to our textbook on network science. If anybody wants to, uh, to just sort of start from the very, very basics, this is, uh, this is mainly aimed at undergraduate students. Um, and we use, we use uh, information diffusion as, 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 one of the, uh, as one of the excuses to um, present work on networks. And then let me just finish by thanking my wonderful team. The, the work that I presented is really the work of many people, uh, my students. I'm very lucky to have wonderful students and colleagues. And of course, I'm grateful to our funding uh, agencies to support our work there. Sorry, I went a little long. Uh, but okay. hopefully there's plenty, plenty of time for, for chatting and discussion. Nice. Thank you very much. This yeah, was great. thank you. I never heard the, uh, the plug that the network science, you only do it to understand the diffusion, which is a really good selling point in the market where there's lots of text. Yeah, yeah. Not, not only for that, but, uh, you know, I, we use information diffusion as an example. Mm -hmm. Like when, when, when we look at diffusion networks, it, it's really an interesting example. So a lot of the stuff that I present here is used as case studies in a bunch of problems where people can, you know, write Python code to get their own data from the Twitter API, for example, and visualize these diffusion networks. Nice. So this is really all very monumental. Um, so I guess there is probably a lot of different questions. Um, and Should I stop sharing? Yeah, so maybe we can, so we can see, see our each other. exactly. Perfect. That's okay. great. Um, okay, so there's already two hands up. Um, I also have one. There's another one hand up. Great. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so Mike had his hand up first. Okay, I win the first question. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, well, uh, it was re really, really very fascinating and very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I will try to be as fast as possible to, to, to leave other people time. Uh, basically, I have one question and one worry. My question is concerning your very first part. Basically, the result you get there when you get a phase separation into, into all blue and all red mm -hmm. is actually quite expectable because all yes. the, all the uh, forces you have in, uh, in this, in this uh, simulation are, yes. are only pulling the, the system apart. But you can yes. imagine that there are some sorts of forces which, which prevent this. For example, uh, to be just concrete, uh, if your uh, immediate uh, somebody from your immediate family posts something uh, you you strongly disagree with, you yes. do not unfriend him him or her because because of because you like him for for, for completely different reasons. Yeah. Uh, can these sort of things stabilize this system in yeah. a in a, in 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 once uh, in, in how strong is this force uh, should this force to be to stabilize it? Can yeah. you study that? That is. That is question number one, and and uh, uh, worry number two, or question number two, is that uh, in uh, your uh, assessment of uh, uh, low credibility links and low credibility sources, uh, you rely on expert opinion, uh, and you in your definition as you defined it, you. You put there both uh, fact, uh, manufactured and factually wrong stuff and biased stuff. And biased, it seems to me, is a much more uh, mm -hmm. weak notion, and, and different people percept biases differently. Mm -hmm. And then you, 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 you are 
uh, you have a risk that that you have a bi expert bias sort of yeah. and and the similar question is basically when you uh, when you looked uh, at the correlation between quality of the news and the popularity in the network you've seen that there is low some weak, uh, almost no correlation essentially Mm -hmm. And uh, you uh, uh, speculated about whether it is possible to, to amplify the quality by uh, somehow combinating quality and popularity in, yeah. in feeding algorithms. Yes. Uh, but it, it implies that you know quality from some yeah. uh, external source. Yes. And, and it, it might be unknowable how to, do, how to yes. deal with that. that that's basically uh, okay. two and a half questions I have. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. These are all really great questions. I think I counted three of them. So let me try to, uh, let me try to go over them briefly. So the first one, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the echo chamber model is, is based on quite well understood uh, opinion dynamics model. Um, I didn't go into much detail, but this is a bounded confidence uh, model. So we know that with bounded confidence uh, influence models, you end up with these uh, pockets of homogeneous, uh, uh, homogeneous um, uh, beliefs. And there are many, many different models, but uh, you know, they're, they're somewhat similar. Uh, so the, the, the main point of the model was not to, to show that uh, this outcome happens but rather to show how much it is accelerated by the presence of both of these ingredients at the same time. Because there are some opinion models that focus on the, on the influence part uh, and others that focus on the rewiring part. There are very few that have looked at those two together. There are some, there are some models that have looked at those together, but not in the context of social media. So we wanted to take, uh, take these models, adapt them to social media, and then quantify how the evolution to this echo chamber um, situation happens as a function of these two ingredients. So the main uh, contribution is that no matter how small the learning parameter and the unfollowing parameter are, as long as they are non-zero, uh, the emergence of the echo chambers is accelerated by orders of magnitude compared to the cases in which they're not, they're zero. So it's really not a particularly surprising result, but it's just sort of, it's an illustration of how mechanisms that are very common in all of, uh, of, our, of our system naturally push us towards that outcome. And so, you know, you are absolutely right. The question is then how to prevent that from happening. And there is actually a lot of research uh, on, on trying to prevent that from happening. You mentioned you might not want to unfriend your crazy uncle. Unfortunately, that's not true. We find that people do unfollow their crazy uncles all the time. Uh, maybe they can't uh, uninvite them from, you know, Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas holidays, but they can definitely well, I, I, I was, them on, I was on thinking more like, like sibling or father or mother. Right. Uncle yeah, yeah. is far can, enough to, to unfriend. Yes. You're right. You cannot, you cannot cut that social link, but you can certainly... Um, be less exposed to them online, whether because you don't interact with them, so the algorithm will learn uh, and not show you those things anymore, uh, or or you can you know even more actively actually decide to mute them if if you find that they post things that are offensive, and we see that this is happening all the time. For example, when people who have looked at conspiracy theorists, they find that these conspiracy theorists eventually distance themselves even from their dear ones. Uh, Sometimes they end up divorcing or separating from their spouse, uh, or you know, or or being completely absorbed and and you know fall into this sort of rabbit hole or black hole as it has been described for QAnon. So um, so unfortunately, we do observe that this you know this 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 dynamics towards echo chambers is real and it happens. So the question is, but how to what to do about it? That's a much harder that's a much harder question. For example, uh, research has shown that simply exposing people to uh, fact checks is actually counterproductive. All right, if you if if you post something and I say, hey, you're wrong, 
uh, here's here's a fact check. Uh, your reaction will not to be, oh, uh, I'm wrong. Maybe I should be more careful. Oh, let me take this post down. No, your reaction is going to say, oh, Phil is such a jerk. He's he's accusing me of, of being wrong. I'm, I'm going to unfollow Phil. Um, so 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 there, there is some research, but it goes into the psychology of, of social interactions and one's tribe and one, you know, the fact that people post things not necessarily because they believe that they're true, but just to signal their membership in a group. Uh, so the, the social psychology of it has to be part of this equation. And um, maybe there are ways to nudge um, uh, there are ways to do interventions that are, you know, th there is a lot of talk about inoculation theory, um, you know, not necessarily contradict people, but remind them uh, about the fact that they can be exposed to low credibility information. Platforms do a lot of this nudging. For example, not now Twitter might say, are you sure you want to share this because you haven't clicked on the link, so you haven't read it yet. So, so there are some, there is definitely work in this area, but uh, there is no you know, general consensus as something that works very well. Even the nudges, the methods that have shown to work, usually they work, but they have very little effect. Very, very, very small effect. Uh, okay, point number two is about low credibility sources and bias. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, so in, in, there can be selection bias. That's why we try to use third party, you know, it's not a good idea that I decide what is a reliable sources or not, because I, of course I have my own bias, but if I rely on uh, journalists who use published methodologies to label uh, the reliability of a source uh, in such a way that it can be verified, uh, perhaps that's slightly less biased. It is true that because of the correlation in the US, for example, between conservative sources and low credibility sources, it is not a, a balanced set. However, there are also low credibility sources on the left. And we definitely uh, you know, include those in our, in our, in our analysis. But, uh, you know, but this is a problem because for the, exactly for the reason that you mentioned, very often fact checkers are accused of being biased. Uh, and and that's also unfortunately uh, sort of a strategy. Uh, if you're trying to manipulate the system, you can just attack the ones who uh, who label you. So this is something that we need to continue working on, and um, it's 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 not perfect. It's not perfect. But if I may, just one little addition. When I said um, hyper, so when I said that under the umbrella of low credibility information, we put hyper partisan sites, I do not mean biased, politically biased sources. I agree with you. That would be a very, very slippery source. So to give you an example, uh, the Wall Street Journal is a biased uh, right leaning source, but I think I would label it as very credible. Um, so in, in our in our data, for example, that's that's considered a, a high credibility source, even though it's biased to the right, or I don't know, the nation is biased biased to the left, but it is considered a, a, a credible source. So when I mean, when I said hyper partisan, I really mean these extreme far right or far less uh, far left sites that are that really uh, post a lot of misinformation that um, yeah, yeah, but, you know, but, but but an example you made was was actually uh great board selecting Breitbart. some right yeah. selecting some yeah. uh, uh, some pieces from cnn i would say that yeah. that probably uh, any combination of pieces from cnn wouldn't be uh, called a uh, unreliable source in my book i'm not i'm not sure if i'm it's right true. in this well part, but, 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 but if you select them so that uh, you are only yeah, yeah, yeah. Selected, then you saying, can make it biased yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 you can make it extremely biased yes yes, yes but, but is it unreliable that, that's, yeah. that's my question yeah yeah so in the case of breitbart is actually labeled as a low credibility source by many fact checkers and yeah, well, probably Breit Breitbart, as, as an example, is, is it's an example of, of a high. This is full of uh, basically purely manufactured stories. Right, it is. Uh, it is. I would it expect. Is. In in some cases, actually, it's it's very subtle. They may not be fully manufactured, but they may take something and just spin it in a certain way. They may take as as often something which is true, 
which is a grain of truth, and then spin it in a certain way to make it look something else. Sometimes this is done very subtly by removing quotes or adding quotes or, or just removing, uh, uh, um, taking a tweet and make it look like it wasn't a tweet or things of that sort, some very subtle ways or taking a, a reliable article and just slapping on top of it a very misleading um, headline. Um, Breitbart is not the only one that does this, of course, uh, but there are sources on both sides. For example, Occupy Democrats is an equivalent on the left. It's a hyper-partisan sites that we would consider low credibility. Uh, it's it's a, one of the most popular on the left. So you're absolutely right. It's not a black and white situation. Uh, by far. Uh, we hope that you, we don't just use bias, but we actually uh, look at high, we, all, we only use bias in the extreme in which hyperpartisan content actually translates into misleading information. Okay, the last point, um, equality versus popularity. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember what this was the yeah, actual- the problem, the problem is that popularity might be- Oh, yes. Knowable. Right, 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 right. You're, you're absolutely like, right. No, no, no. However, there are some signals that I believe are available, uh, especially to platforms that have a huge amount of data. So just to say something really, really simple. I mean, uh, Facebook has a, has a lot of uh, content that is fact-checked by fact-checkers that they pay. And so they can definitely tell that a particular source is low credibility because many articles from that source have been debunked by fact checkers that they trust. So that would be a quality signal that they could use if they wanted to. And we know from the whistleblowers that they do have access to quality signals, but that they on purpose de-emphasize them because when they emphasize them, engagement goes down. And so they make less money from ads. Uh, they also have, again, this is something we know from the whistleblowers, they have quality signals based on simple network metrics like page rank. Right, so just like Google uses PageRank to find uh, reliable uh, reliable sources and website high quality websites, Facebook has the same kind of information. Whether it comes from the web, obviously, you know, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal will have you know higher page rank than you know some fake uh, Utah Press uh, journal, some fake new websites created five days ago. Uh, so they have, they do have access to some quality signals. They may not be perfect, but they could certainly be leveraged. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mila. Yeah, I, I also want to first thank you for amazing talk. It's, it's really interesting research that you're doing. And, uh, I also kind of like want to give you credit for for creating all these wonderful tools because it's also kind of like you know social um or socially very meaningful and important what you are doing here Thank um you. i wanted to ask kind of um so many of the examples that you are giving are seem to be based on on english language and and american kind of like discussions so i wanted to ask have you been uh, looking at any uh, discussions in any other languages whether the patterns are similar also in kind of like other language bubbles and and also i'm i'm curious to know if you have been looking at kind of like you know um a distribution of, of information uh, across languages. Um, my question raises from uh, from one of my studies uh, in which I'm looking at um, like spreading and, and uh, like development of fake historical narratives, both in Finnish and in, and in Russian online environments. And it seems to me that the discussions, although kind of like in both both of these realms, there are uh, there are fake fake historical narratives they kind of like are still a little bit different um and although i can see that there are kind of like clear examples of of kind of like this uh, you know dissemination of of good fake stories from from russian online uh, environment to finnish online environment and vice versa mm -hmm. so yeah that's my question. Yeah, no, excellent question. And I have to say that, you know, uh, we have limited resources and expertise. And so most of our work, as you said, is focused on English. 
Uh, the only cases in which once in a while we get to a little bit explore other languages when we're working with a collaborator uh, who is interested in that. And so one example is a, a Mexican uh, collaborator who was interested in looking at one particular type of uh, abuse on Twitter. These were bots that were probably by the government, although attribution was very difficult, that were meant to disable or attack uh, a protest movement. It was called the Yamakanze movement. And so we, we did a paper together uh, and with his help, we were able to look at this um, particular, disinf it wasn't even a disinformation campaign. It was a, it was a suppression campaign really. Uh, which 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 targeted Spanish languages, in particular Mexican um, political debate. Um, so you know we're happy to help and assist if there is if there is a, you know if there are, there is a chance, but uh, but our 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 expertise is limited. I will mention that uh, some tools could lend themselves more than others to be applied to other languages. For example, Hoxie. Um, so. I, I went kind of fast, but there's two modes. One that does live Twitter search, and that's language independent. So that you can use in any language. Um, and uh, then the other mode is the one where we where you use it like a search engine. You look for articles, and then you look at how articles that you select have been spreading. Now, uh, that is based on sources that you select. Uh, so the version of Hoxie that we run with our servers is based on English uh, local reliability sources, but the but it's open source, so anybody can pick that up and create a version of Hoxie to focus on a particular uh, different country context or language context. So, for example, uh, one of the graduate students that was visiting our lab recently made a version of Hoxie for Italy called Hoax Italy, and it's running, and they track Italian disinformation sources. Uh, another group made a version for Brazil. Um, so they track Brazilian uh, disinformation sources. So uh, those tools could potentially be useful to support research um, in other languages. Uh, there are some subtleties because that uh, Hoxie, uh, you know, the search engine itself uh, uses open source tools to do, to do indexing. And those tools often are language dependent. So some, sometimes there are tools that can be applied to other languages, other times not. So there is some hacking to do to make, to make it work in other languages. Um, but, um, you know, it's possible. Uh, but, uh, but that's very limited. We, we, yeah, uh, you, you're absolutely right. We, we focus mostly on English. So can I can I follow up on the question because it's a country that is both uh, dear to you and my heart also. Uh, how about Italy? There is no polarization going on. It's more complicated. Um, so, uh, what's what what will what will happen in the grand scheme of things when the polarizations break down, as they have in Italy? Quite a yeah, while, right? I I honestly don't follow the Italian political situation as much anymore. <laughs> um, so, so I'm, I'm not the expert on, on Italian politics, believe it or not, <laughs> but, uh, I, I think to some degree, well, there has always been polarization there as well. It's just maybe not been, it's, it wasn't a bipartisan, mm -hmm. you know, a two party system. And so the polarization was a little bit more complicated, but my impression is that if anything, it has been moved more towards a oh, okay. two-party system. I mean, it's still not, but uh, for example, the right, uh, the conservative side has really coalesced. Mm -hmm. It used to be a minority side, and then there was a big role played by the Santa, the Christian Democrats, et cetera. As all of those have disintegrated over the last 20, 30 years, the right has grown and has become more similar to uh, conservative uh, movements in other parts of Europe and in the US. There is a strong anti-immigrant sentiment. Mm -hmm. There is a growing populist sentiment, the, the, the five-star movement, although maybe you can't align it so well with right and left, but it strongly has, a, a, it has clearly a strong partisan, sorry, a, a strong uh, populist uh, flavor. And so those things are probably in some sense more like rather than less like, um, you know, US and um, sort of two, two party, two party mm -hmm. system. It's more fragmented, but when you look at it on Twitter, it looks a lot like, okay. 
it looks a lot like there is the right and then there's everybody else. Okay. And is it possible to separate uh, into more than two clusters? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh yeah, of course, of course. And uh, like uh, another uh, a former postdoc of ours, I didn't mention it earlier, um, um, uh, Diogo Pacheco, who's now at Exeter, uh, he looked at uh, Brazilian uh, Brazilian movements and disinformation, and also there it's very very fragmented. There is tons of tons of different parties, but uh, but but the right is is much more homogeneous in some sense and larger than every other cluster. So it looks very much like a very strong conservative bloc and then a very fragmented everyone else. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Ruta. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, really inspiring also for me as a uh, active uh, Twitter user and I already found your institute on Twitter and will try to keep updated and uh, spread this information for other <laughs> my followers uh, because yeah, I think it's so important to understand the, the social media that you're using because at, after this presentation, for example, we might be less vulnerable to this misinformation, hopefully. And um, what I noticed in uh, one of the first um, uh, slides of the presentation about the echo cambers, uh, where there were the two main echo cambers in, and in one of them in this, uh, um, in the conservative, uh, in this place, uh, there was a huge spread of misinformation and uh, some of them spread also in the other camber, but there were also these fact checks. Uh, mm -hmm. I was thinking um, the um, these tools are probably analyzing only the sharing of the links, but not, um, not what people have written there, right? For example, right. the, I don't know, the second camber or also the first one could be sharing uh, this link and saying hey look it's uh, it's misinformation or sharing it ironically or something like that and of right. course the fact checkers also come up maybe hours or even days later mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes yes very good point so really um there are different ways different things that one might focus on uh, so links are one of the, uh, you know, kind of entities that we focus on the most because they're kind of easy to extract and they're easy to associate with a source for which we have labels. So you're right, there is a lot of emphasis on links, but we don't only study links. For some analysis, we focus on hashtags. Uh, so for example, one of my students set up a monitoring system during the uh, 2018 midterm elections and just monitoring content based on political hashtags. And you have hashtags uh, associated with the right, with the left, and you also have hashtags associated with misinformation campaigns. Uh, for example, here in the US, there was this famous campaign, Stop the Steal, which led to the assault on the US Capitol, January 6th. Uh, and Stop the Steal was a very clear label that is still being used to highlight a, a, a range of false narratives. So sometimes um, hashtags can also be used. For example, we, in the Covaxi, in the vaccination campaign, we track uh, hashtags as well. And we have hashtags that we know are associated with certain false narratives. Uh, and, and misinformation about vaccines. So it's not only links, sometimes hashtags can be useful. Sometimes there are phrases. So in the, in the um, uh, bot slayer tool that I showed you very briefly earlier, what we do is we extract a number of different pieces of content from a tweet. We extract phrases, noun, uh, you, know, uh, you know, like bigram, trigrams, noun phrases. We extract uh, um, usernames. Uh, we extract uh, hashtags and we extract links. And all of these can be used in, depending on the circumstance and the context to track different kind of narratives. So, um, uh, but, but, but you're right, sometimes it's, it's a little bit um, um, tricky. For example, uh, we look at retweets of tweets with low credibility links. We don't consider necessarily quoted tweets. The reason is that quoted um, more, it can happen that you retweet something that you disagree with, 
But more often, a retweet is a signal that you are agreeing and you're supporting something. Whereas a lot of people, people a lot of times people quote something that they disagree with. Uh, even though journalists don't encourage this, like journalists, fact checkers say you should never you should never link to a piece of misinformation in your article. You should never quote uh, a misinformation tweet. You should always either uh, quote some sort of third party source that has that that reports on that but doesn't bring traffic to that source or take a screenshot and write false on it but nevertheless some people quote it and so that's why for example we don't use quoted tweets to look at the spread because it might be somebody who says this is false or this is inaccurate or um or or you know this or or maybe ironically like you said uh, makes fun of it uh, so, um, so it depends. In some cases, you want to look at retweets. In some cases, you want to look at quotes. In some cases, you want to look at mentions or replies to when you're looking at conversations, if people are actually having a dialogue with certain source to see if they are vulnerable and so on. So it really depends on the, on the context. Thank you. Next one is Mar. Hello. Thank you for, for the wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. I, I have a question about the polarization. Um, I have, a, I am, I guess everyone is like a, a known thing that is like, I, I see more and more aggressiveness in the, in the social media. I am a practicing artist. And even in the art world, I had seen the aggressiveness going high, even like nowadays, I tell you, I only put, um, put things in the in the social media related to my art. Um, I had been situations where, for example, topic like NFTs had polarized the whole art community um, in a way incredible. Even there is uh, false information too. I am personally, for example, only doing NFTs in Tezos blockchain because it's 99 more eff uh, efficient than than ethereum one even though this there is people that don't they put all in the same pack uh, the nfts and they don't care it's just you just talk about nfts even if it's just a certification system and and you tell them that they consume the same electricity than nft that than a twitter a, a tweet they don't believe and then they just like um uh, and what is your take out on this kind of like, I, I understand that this, uh, ah, I wanted to mention one thing when you were like in this section where I asked before, uh, there is this uh, probably, I don't know if you know, there is this famous like AI uh, paper that revolutionized the last years that is, is uh, attention is all you need mm -hmm. uh, f uh, that talks about transformers. And, and you, when you were actually explaining that, I was like, I was like, um thinking only in the transformers in like the, the um because it's actually uh adds all the combinations uh, and before the the regression models they didn't add mm -hmm. um and and yeah when you don't have time you don't make all the combinations and then just like pass one to another but i, I don't know just like a, a question about this of the if you had analyzed or if you had find some kind of like thing on this but thank you very much for the talk. Really yeah, enjoyed. thank you, Mark. Yeah, I mean, your comment about uh, polarization, I think it's very apropos. In fact, I think that the whole point of the demonstration of that simple model that, that uh, on the emergence of echo chamber, it, I think is, it, it, it's a good key to interpret what you observe. It doesn't have to be politics, right? I mean, in that, in that we call it conservative liberal, but imagine any uh, topic that is new where people are not aligned, Eventually, some people will have different opinions, and then by our natural tendency to want to align with our friends or our tribe, uh, inevitably you end up with this with this uh, with this polarization. Uh, it happens. You, you mentioned the example of art. Uh, that's a very, very, very good one. I think these days it happens everywhere because polarization is so strong. Whenever there is a new issue, even though that issue is not necessarily aligned with traditional political line, somehow it very, very quickly becomes aligned. So, I mean, uh, for me, the most obvious example is um, uh, the response to the pandemic, right? I think a priori, there is no reason that makes 
pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine, something that is aligned with liberals or conservatives, right? I mean, um, or, or wearing masks or not. You could imagine that conservatives are for order, law and order. And so if the government says wear a mask, then you wear a mask. But in fact, it turned to be exactly the opposite. Um, so I, I think sometimes these things are hard to predict a priori. There is this dynamic where it's like a phase transition. You have a little bit of a break of the symmetry. And then at some point, some the moment that some liberal says, I think we should mask, then that's enough to uh, lead to this polarization where the Republicans, <clears throat> simply because they have to say the opposite of the liberal, then they have to be anti-mask or vice versa, right? Uh, so, uh, so this is, you know, we, we live in a world where information travels so fast that your alignment and you immediately know what other people's opinion are and, and so inevitably your opinion gets affected much more by your tribe uh, and, and you know, by the need to align with your friends rather than thinking as an independent thinker. We know, I mean, there is a lot of psychological studies that, that show that, um, you know, like think of the, uh, the music game, right? Like you, you want to align with, with other people. So only by keeping people independent, you will have objective opinions. In, um, and so this social media makes it very, very hard for people to form their own opinion uh, they, because they are immediately influenced by the opinions of their tribe. So I, I think that's where this um, polarization comes from. And that's why we see this, uh, this aggression that you mentioned. So you're, you're making a case for the opinion of, you know, Michael Macy that, uh, you know, why liberals drink lots of. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's a, exactly. It's, a, it's a matter of social physics, not, exactly. of, not of social behavior. Ex yeah, 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 exactly. So, I mean, I, I, I think we should all, you know, not access news through, from social media because uh, I think the filter of our friends is a very biased filter. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and ideally we should spend less time knowing what everybody thinks. <laughs> <laughs> to because all of those things, yeah, are, are biasing a lot more, pushing us towards more polarization. Yeah, but so, people wanted to, to, to align with, with their friends forever. It, it is not a new yeah. thing. And, yeah, but we've and, lowered... And, and we, wait, 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 wait. People in, in tra the traditional sure. society depended much more on their neighbors. And yeah, yeah, but, but we've lowered the friction. Well... Okay. Uh, sorry, so, yes. sorry, there is Mila and Mark who want to ask a question. It was just a random comment. It's a, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Mila and Mark, we'll come back to you in a second. But I, I think if I may just, yes, you're right. But the friction has, has gone much down for you to interact with a much larger tribe, right? So now instead of five friends at the bar, you have 5 million people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the dynamics are very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we get three more minutes, uh, okay. two more minutes. Uh, Mila, can I take Mark first? Okay, good. Mark. Hello, thank you for inspiring talk. Uh, so my, my no connection to, to before that, uh, uh, what fosters the, uh, what is important is the people are looking for sort of connectivity and sharing what is already there. But have, have you also noticed that uh, uh, like certain uh, events, let's say natural disasters or et cetera, like happening, that, that does this kind of things have actually effect on uh, that, uh, like less fake news are shared, right? uh -huh, perhaps. Uh -huh because people are more yeah. focused on what is actually out there or something like actually, that. Actually, it's the opposite. Uh, after natural disasters, we see actually a proliferation of misinformation. Uh, 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 Katie Starbird uh, at the University of Washington has been uh, one of the people who have uh, studied this a lot. And so she, she, she started, she came to misinformation from studying uh, online discussions around emergencies. And uh, this is something that actually psychologists have known a lot of time. In the, in the presence of vacuum, in the presence of uncertainty, that's when we are most vulnerable to, to misinformation. So when, when there is some new event that happens, and actually COVID is a good example, right? Uh, as the CDC was figuring things out, policies were changing, suggestions were changing. And in the midst of that, it was easy for people to inject 
misinformation and uh, create doubt and things like ivermectin and hydroxychloric quinine, whatever it was called, you know, all of these are examples of misinformation that flourishes in the presence of uh, of doubt or in the presence of, uh, you know, information vacuum and, and, uh, and uncertainty. So it, it turns out, I think that it's, uh, that actually uncertainty makes things worse, I think. So if this was soccer, we would be in overtime, but we started a little late. So can we take Mila's question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I will try to be really brief. Um, although my question, I think that um, you get this question quite a lot and, and I, uh, maybe you don't have a kind of like definite answer, but I'm kind of like um, trying to think about the motivations for, uh, for um, um, fabricating uh, fake, uh, fake mm -hmm. or false information. Of yeah. course, as you said, uh, as you just said, there are kind of like in the moments of doubt when people don't know the rumors start to spread and people are just kind of like maybe that's one of the reasons you also also mentioned uh kind of like political um purposes and and sometimes just for money yeah um but kind of like what is your hunch what are the kind of like what is the most common per or kind of motivation or or cause for for this is there any kind of like I, I think you mentioned them. I, I think they are the same things that drive all human activities, right? Uh, power, money. <laughs> uh, in, in politics is power. Uh, power is money. Money is politics. The, all these things are related. I mean, you social media and misinformation are just a tool. Um, you know, in some sense, think about marketing th uh, and propaganda. They've always existed. And it is just a way to, you know, to get to your goal, whatever your goal is, whether it's to have people vote for you or to have people buy your product. Um, and, and so social media is just another, another arena in which you can do that. And, uh, you know, maybe there is, there is some gray line in the ethical values between marketing and propaganda and disinformation campaign, right? uh so some but but hopefully the the extreme are pretty obvious and then maybe there is some gray area in between i mean if you think of bots in some sense they are like free ads right like you could use ads you could pay facebook and twitter to get your message out there in front of tens of thousands of people but you could also uh you know develop a bunch of bots for free and have the same outcome so in in some sense it could be just a a, a way to save money. Uh, we see bots used for spreading uh, malware. That's uh, done, you know, maybe you want to make money from, uh, you know, from malware. Or, or um, I mentioned cryptocurrency, right? These are, those are people who are trying to make a quick buck by, by fraud. So all the regular motivations of human nature, uh, if, if ethics is not in the way, will naturally lead you to, to, to abuse these systems. Um, yeah, that is an awesome final word. Uh, thank you very much. This was great, and I hope we all meet um, in a future conference sooner rather than later. Except, uh, like, instead of sitting back at home. So let's give <laughs> yes. the speaker a final applause. Thank you, um, thank you, thank you. Have a Thanks good everybody. Start. Have a good start into the day. Thank you, thank you. Thanks everybody. Hope to meet you all in person sometime soon. Yes. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.